Hi, my name is Edward Lee. I lead a community think tank and campaign group, Smarter Cambridge Transport, which advances sustainable, integrated and equitable transport for the Cambridge region. I also write a weekly column for the Cambridge Independent newspaper, and I recently completed a Master's in Transport Economics at the University of Leeds Institute for Transport Studies. Now I'm going to talk to you today about how to decarbonise transport. Now the first question we need to ask is, how long have we got? Now I'm sure you're well aware that the UK government has set a target to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, net zero means any carbon emissions that are still happening in 2050 are offset by something that removes CO2 from the atmosphere, such as new trees uh, or some form of chemical or mechanical carbon capture and storage. Now illustrated here is a possible pathway from 2020 to net zero in 2050. And actually the annual emissions I'm showing here are global. So this is starting from the current annual global emissions and seeing how those might be reduced to zero in 2050. Now in 2019, the UN Climate Action Summit proposed that in order to meet uh, the ambition to limit the increase in global temperatures to one and a half degrees centigrade, we needed exponential action. And that looks like this in the yellow curve. So the emissions are halved by 2030 and then halved again by 2040 and again by 2050. Now you'll notice that here the uh, net emissions do not reach zero before 2070. Now, does that matter? Well, what really matters are the cumulative emissions. That's the sum of the emissions year after year after year, which accumulate in the atmosphere and drive climate change. Now, you can see here that the, um, the yellow line, which was the exponential reductions in carbon dioxide emissions, that peaks below the original one we started, the original pathway we started. And that means that the total amount of carbon dioxide we push into the atmosphere is lower, and therefore the effects on the climate will be lower. But in fact, neither of these pathways falls within the carbon budget identified by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In its, in its special report on the impacts of global warming of one and a half degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, it came up with a figure of 495 gigatons or billions of tons of CO2 from 2020 as the maximum amount that we can emit to have a 50% chance of containing the average global temperature rise to one and a half degrees centigrade and hopefully thereby avoiding runaway changes to ecosystems. Now that budget is shown here as a green dashed line and a possible pathway that stays within that budget as a solid green line. Now the difference between these pathways may not appear all that significant on a graph, but they may be the difference between a largely habitable earth and a largely uninhabitable earth, where sea level rise, salinated soils, dried up meltwater rivers, exhausted aquifers and so on, make large parts of the planet uninhabitable, in particular coastal regions and low-lying islands. So that green pathway is shown here in terms of annual emissions. And you can see it's significantly steeper than the red one that we started with. In other words, the emissions, the, the reductions in emissions are achieved more quickly. And like the exponential curve, the yellow one, the um, emissions are reduced by approximately half by 2030, um, but then continue to be reduced um, much more quickly than in either um, of the other two scenarios so that we reach net zero uh, well before 2050. So the takeaway from this is that it's carbon budgets and pathways that matter more than a net zero target year. So why is transport important? Well, transport accounts for about 16% of global greenhouse emissions and about a fifth of all the energy that we consume. Now, if we look at the uh, energy consumption in the UK by um, sector, um, we can see, um, well, firstly, that actually the total energy consumption has not changed all that much in the last 50 years. 
Um, the big changes are in transport, and you can see the bottom two um, uh, areas. So the bottom area is the, the grey one is road transport, and then the blue above that is other modes of transport, that's rail and aviation and shipping. Um, the area above that is uh, domestic, so that's mostly um, home heating and um, electricity use in the home, uh, and that has sort of grown with, with population growth. Um, the one above that, the red, the industry, now that has shrunk quite significantly, and that's largely because we've exported a lot of our uh, manufacturing. And, and by doing that, we've also exported a lot of our carbon emissions. And then the top brown area, that's uh, called services, that's actually mostly farming. Now, when we look at that in percentage terms, um, it becomes clearer uh, what, the what those changes have been. And you can see now that road transport accounts for nearly 30% of our, um, the UK's energy consumption, um, and including the other modes of transport, it's uh, very close to 40%. So it's a very significant um, uh, consumer of energy within the UK. So the reason why transport is important is because it's a major contributor uh, to total greenhouse gas emissions. So is vehicle electrification the answer? Well, let's start by putting electricity into perspective. Electricity is an energy vector, i.e. a way of moving energy around. It's not an energy source. That's also true of hydrogen. Um, there's no readily available source of hydrogen we can tap into. So what we're really interested in is the energy source, whether that be fossil fuels or the sun, and the sun powers solar panels, but also drives the winds um, and through evaporation of water makes possible hydroelectric um, power sources. Um, the moon drives the tides and it's also possible to extract energy from those. And there's nuclear, geothermal and other sources of energy. The British government makes much of how successful we have been in reducing the carbon emissions from electricity generation. Now, it is true that about half of electricity generated today is from low carbon sources. But low carbon is not the same as renewables. Uh, low carbon includes nuclear and also biofuels, and biofuels includes burning wood and waste. Now, much of the reduction in carbon emissions has been achieved by switching from coal to natural gas. Natural gas has about half the carbon emissions of coal for the same amount of electricity energy. Um, and then more recently, it's been through large expansion of wind generation. But we consume much more energy in other forms than electricity. So boasting about how green our electricity is, is rather like boasting about how good your diet is because your breakfast comprises fresh fruit and muesli, but neglecting to mention that the rest of your meals are burgers and chips, um, because actually in reality, 84% of our energy still comes from fossil fuels. So looking at the UK's total energy consumption, it now becomes very clear how dominated it is for, by fossil fuels. Um, the oil is mostly to produce petrol and diesel, and there's now only a small contribution for coal. Um, and then the 40% for gas is mostly to heat buildings and to uh, power the gas turbine power stations. Now, of the true renewables, uh, hydropower is a very, very small contributor. That's the dark blue uh, to the top, top left. Um, the pale blue uh, near the top is the wind, and then the yellow at the top is the solar. Um, now, only really the wind and the solar are truly scalable. There's not much more capacity in hydropower. We don't have um, many more lakes or rivers that we can dam. Uh, there may be a scope for a contribution from tidal and wave. Uh, but if we just focus on wind and solar, we're currently um, increasing capacity um, of those by about 21% each year. Now, in order for us to replace um, all of the fossil fuel and the unsustainable biofuels, we need to increase the 3.6% share um, that those have to 88%. And that would require um, increasing the rate at which we build out new turbines and install solar panels by more than 50% in order to decarbonize all energy generation in the UK by 2030. And we'd also need to install uh, energy storage. 
because as is well known, um, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. So we need some form of energy storage so that we can take surplus um, um, when, the, when, there is, when there is a surplus and then we can feed it back into the electricity grid when there are gaps in supply. So that's just looking at the UK. But in the context of climate change, we really need to take a global perspective. And that's partly for the obvious reason that uh, climate doesn't pay any attention to country boundaries. I mean, it doesn't uh, respond to how much uh, a particular country is emitting. Um, but it, more importantly, uh, we've exported a lot of our carbon emissions to other countries, um, partly by you know, exporting our manufacturing, as I mentioned earlier, but also because we rely on um, raw materials that are mined in other countries. Um, our consumption uh, patterns, particularly of, of, of meat, are leading to deforestation in other parts of the world. Um, so these are all um, carbon emissions for which we bear responsibility, even though they may be attributed to another country. Um, also, because we started our industrial revolution in the 19th century, uh, we've actually cumulatively been responsible for uh, many, many, many more emissions uh, than, than most other countries, and particularly developing countries. Now, looking at the world's energy sources, uh, the big differences with the UK are with uh, the proportion of coal. So whereas the UK has more or less weaned itself off coal, um, other countries, particularly those that have access to abundant quantities of coal close to the surface, that includes China and India, Brazil and Australia, um, they still are very dependent on coal as a cheap source of energy. Um, now other countries, uh, more mountainous countries, have more access to hydropower, um, but globally, um, the scalable renewables, so that's the wind and the solar, account for just 1.4% compared to the 3.6% in the UK. So actually scaling up uh, renewable generation uh, to replace fossil fuels um, is an even bigger challenge when we look at it from a global perspective. But looking at world energy sources in a historical context, you can see here how rapidly uh, the world has increased its consumption of energy since around 1950, and that most of that growth, in fact, almost all of that growth, is through consumption of fossil fuels. The bottom red is traditional biomass, which is mostly burning wood. Um, and the true renewables are really a tiny fraction of the total energy consumption, and there is really no sign that the total energy demand is flattening off, um, yet alone declining. So this really shows how big a challenge we face in uh, decarbonising our energy consumption worldwide. So now that we've looked at electricity in the context of total energy consumption, I come back to my earlier question, is vehicle electrification the answer? So let's look where we're starting from. Well, currently in the world, there's about one and a half billion vehicles in use. Each year we manufacture about 94 million vehicles. About half of those are additional, so they're adding to the total fleet in the world, and about half are replacement, so they're replacing vehicles that have been scrapped. Of the 94 million, uh, about one and a half percent are battery electric, um, and that's, that is increasing uh, quite rapidly now. Now I've deliberately omitted hybrid vehicles, that's because what are now called self-charging hybrids um, derive all of their power from the petrol or diesel you put in the tank. Uh, they are marginally more efficient than a conventional petrol or diesel vehicle because they can recover some of the energy when you apply the brakes, um, but they're not running off renewable energy. Um, Plug-in hybrids are a transitional technology really while we build out the recharging network. Um, they are better than um, uh, conventional vehicles as long as they are charged up regularly and uh, run off the battery rather than off the um, petrol or diesel or the engine. Now in thinking about electrifying uh, the fleet of vehicles that we use, let's make some reasonable but ambitious assumptions. So the first of them is that all electricity demand can be met by 100% renewable electricity generation by 2030. Uh, let's also assume that all new vehicles manufactured from 2030 are battery electric. Let's also assume that the growth in the total number of vehicles remains roughly constant, currently 44 million 
additional vehicles a year. And of course, that's mostly in developing countries. And let's also assume that the rate of retirement of petrol diesel vehicles accelerates gradually over the next few decades. Now that could lead us to a scenario that looks something like this, where we are continuing to manufacture internal combustion engine vehicles for the next few years. But from the late 2020s, there's a rapid transition to manufacturing um, uh, new battery electric vehicles and replacing uh, existing internal combustion engine vehicles with battery electric so that by around 2050 uh, all vehicles on the road are battery electric. Now that entails more than doubling vehicle production um, in the 2030s um, having converted all existing vehicle production plants to manufacturing battery electric vehicles. So this illustrates the cumulative carbon cost of road transport using the assumptions I've just made. So the bottom sliver is the embodied carbon cost of my continuing to manufacture uh, petrol and diesel vehicles. Above that, the blue sliver is the carbon cost of manufacturing uh, battery electric vehicles. That's uh, relatively small because of the assumption that all the energy that's used in that manufacturing um, is from renewable sources from around 2030. Um, but the large area above that, the pale orange, um, that is the carbon emissions from continuing to drive petrol diesel vehicles. Um, and then there's a very tiny sliver above that, which is the emissions uh, from battery electric vehicles. And that's so small because I made that assumption that from 2030, all electricity that uh, is used to run those vehicles is from renewable sources. So it is really clear that by far the biggest contributor to the cumulative carbon emissions is continuing to use existing petrol and diesel vehicles. And that leads us to a total uh, cumulative emissions of about 125 gigatons. Now consider that 125 gigatons in the context of the global carbon budget of 495 gigatons that I mentioned earlier. Well, it's 25%. Now, road transport accounts for about 12% of current emissions. So what we'd be in effect saying is that road transport should have about double its share of the total budget in order to decarbonize. Now that's not gonna happen. Um, there are much harder sectors than road transport to decarbonize. And so we simply cannot afford to take budget from other sectors uh, in order to, de to decarbonize road transport. So what happens if we make more ambitious assumptions about how, we, how quickly we transition from petrol diesel vehicles to battery electric? So here I've assumed that we retire petrol and diesel vehicles about 50% quicker than in the previous scenario. And that means that we uh, more or less in, uh, phase out all internal combustion engine vehicles by about 2040. So what does that do for the total cumulative carbon emissions? Well, it does bring them down, but as you can see, still by far the biggest contributor is the carbon emissions from continuing to drive those petrol diesel vehicles. Now it's come down to about 108 uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalent, um, but that's still 22% of the total carbon budget we have to work with. So that, that still isn't gonna work. And we've made some really ambitious assumptions even to get there. So what this has shown is that the continuing to use petrol diesel vehicles uh, will emit far more um, carbon emissions than we can afford. And that is uh, even making some very optimistic assumptions about what all the countries in the world will do to phase out petrol diesel vehicles and replace them with battery electric. And on top of that, there's Jevons paradox. Now, any of you who have studied economics will, I'm sure, be familiar with Jevons paradox, also known as the rebound effect. Now, in very simplistic terms, it asserts that if you make something cheaper, then we will consume more of it. Um, and that's certainly true in transport. Now, in this country, petrol attracts 
uh, duty at a rate of about 58 pence a litre um, and 20% VAT, and that VAT is also applied to the duty. By contrast, electricity attracts just 5% VAT. Now that difference uh, accounts for a large uh, amount of the difference in cost uh, per mile of driving an electric vehicle as against driving a petrol or a diesel vehicle. And that difference is even greater if you can charge your electric vehicle from off-peak electricity um, or effectively for free from home-generated uh, solar electricity. So the cheaper driving becomes, uh, unfortunately, the more we will drive. Um, and that's, uh, that is not good uh, in terms of energy consumption, and nor is it good in terms of congestion. Now, the only way to counteract that um, is for countries to introduce road pricing, in other words, to um, add a tax per mile that replaces uh, fuel duty. Uh, now, at the moment, uh, Singapore is the only country to have a road pricing scheme. There are some cities that have uh, some uh, form of road pricing, um, mostly um, some form of tolling. Um, but at the moment, the UK has no plans to introduce road pricing, um, even though it is actually essential that it does, because the Treasury at the moment relies on uh, more than £30 billion of revenue from fuel duty and VAT uh, on on uh, petrol and diesel. Um, and uh, as we move to driving electric vehicles, uh, that revenue will dry up. So the conclusion is that electrification of vehicles is not the answer, at least it's not the whole answer. We do need to replace petrol diesel vehicles with electric, but we can't do it quickly enough to avoid the existing petrol diesel vehicles um, emitting far more carbon emissions than we can afford. Now, if you do need to buy a new car, um, ask yourself, can you wait until you can afford to buy an all electric? Because over the life of that car, it will be the more sustainable solution um, because it will be able to draw its energy from renewable sources through the, through the, through the power grid. Um, and I do emphasize not a hybrid car because that is, um, for the reasons that I mentioned before, um, it is not uh, drawing its energy from renewable sources, and that is the only long-term sustainable solution. So then, what is the answer? Well, the answer is very simple, ridiculously simple in fact. It's to reduce vehicle miles, because this is the only way to reduce the emissions from petrol and diesel vehicles. It will also reduce total energy consumption from road transport, which will bring forward the time when all energy can be sourced from renewables. Now in practice, that means making fewer long distance trips by car, making shorter distance trips by walking, cycling or public transport, and consuming less stuff that has to be transported large distances. So what does that mean at a personal level in practical terms? Well, here are just a few suggestions. Um, if you get the opportunity, try out an e-bike. Um, they're very convenient and they're surprisingly fun. Um, you can go much longer distances than you'd contemplate with a, a regular bike um, without working up a sweat. Um, and people who have tried them um, usually rave about how much fun they are. If you listen to Ed Miliband's excellent Reasons to be Cheerful podcast, um, he recently discovered uh, the joys of e-bikes and uh, was uh, really converted. Now, something you might not have thought about is the consequences of asking for next day delivery for online orders. Now, when you do that, you force the logistics company to schedule a van to come to your street tomorrow. Now, if you give them two or three days to schedule that delivery, then they can group your delivery with other people's in the local area, and that greatly reduces vehicle miles. Now, if you have more than one car, Ask yourself if you could replace one by joining a car club. Uh, Enterprise Car Club and the Zipcar both have cars in Cambridge. And in fact, Enterprise has a couple in the villages outside Cambridge. Now, there will be times when a car isn't available when you need one, um, but taxes are there as a backup and also conventional car hire, um, especially for longer trips. But the big thing though, is planning how in future um, you can reduce uh, both regular, such as commuting uh, trips, 
and longer distance trips uh, to visit family um, and to go on holiday. Now I've mostly been focused on road transport, but actually the biggest single carbon cost that an individual incurs um, in the course of the year typically is an overseas flight. So if you can choose a holiday destination that you can reach by rail, that can greatly reduce your carbon footprint. Now, if you make business trips, um, question whether you need to make it. Uh, now that we've got used to using Zoom, I think it's now clear that there's uh, much more that we can do online using video, video conferencing um, and therefore probably don't need to make as many business trips um, and certainly business flights um, to uh, have meetings and go to conferences. Um, now, this last point won't apply to very many people, um, but the carbon costs are significant if you're thinking of moving abroad or buying a second home abroad, or perhaps you already have a second home abroad. Um, so really think through carefully uh, the carbon impacts of all the additional trips that you will be making and friends and family will be making in order to stay in contact. And I've illustrated here um, the carbon footprint of a typical four person family um, over the course of a year. And in that year, they've taken a holiday to Disneyland, Florida. So the red rectangle at the top right is the carbon cost of flights to Orlando. Now, if instead that family went to Disneyland, Paris, then the 10 tonnes of CO2 that would have been incurred by flying to Orlando becomes 0 0.02 tonnes by taking the train to Paris. And you can see what a dramatic impact that would have in reducing the family's carbon footprint. But there's only so much that you can achieve at a personal level. We do need um, social change and we need systems change. So how can we, how can we build consensus for change that affects everybody? Well, the most important thing to do is to get engaged. Um, and that means resolving to shape your own future rather than waiting for politicians to figure out what uh, you should be doing. And I think um, it's become abundantly clear, especially over the last six months through COVID, uh, that politicians really are not necessarily the best people to work out what's best for you. Now, we all need to get used to the idea, to get comfortable with the idea that we all need to make changes. Um, and the best way to do that is to start talking about them. Uh, you know, testing out ideas, talking with family, with friends, with work colleagues about things that we feel we need to do or that we might do um, and seeing what their reactions are and what advice they might have um, and starting to, to work out a plan uh, for what we will do uh, because without a plan we won't act. Uh, now one quite useful exercise which has been um, popular in, in, in Japan, something part of called the future design movement, is to imagine yourself the age you are now living in 2040, say. Now, uh, in that world, the um, effects of climate change will be much more apparent, um, particularly extreme weather events and so on. So imagine living in that world and looking back to the 2020s and thinking what you could have done differently that might have changed uh, the outcome in, 20, in 2040. Um, now, we also need to build community groups. So lead or join community discussions about what you can do at a community level. Um, that might be to, you know, uh, working together um, to um, you know, do retrofits on, on your homes, or it might be to um, work out what uh, community services um, and, and amenities you, you want to bring um, to make more local. Now you might have heard about the idea of 20 minute neighbourhoods and this is really about uh, bringing more of our lives uh, closer to home so that we just don't need to travel so much um, to live our lives, to, to go to work, to go to school, um, to see friends and family, um, to go play, to go and play, do sports, um, um, to, go, to go to cultural events and so on and so on. Um, so when ask yourself, uh, what do you drive to now that you'd like to have locally or that you'd like to be able to reach by cycle or bus? Um, and, you know, talk to people locally to find out what, um, what other people would like 
and, and see if there are things that uh, you know that there's a, a consensus for that people would like to come together to make happen. You know, and that might be um, to set up a community-run shop or um, start a weekly farmers market. Uh, it might be to come together to develop a plan for improving cycle links um, or footpaths or bus shelters. Now there are lots of organisations that you can turn to for help and advice um, and there's also that you can support and get involved in. Um, now the local councils with relatively little resource um, are, are doing their best uh, to provide information and uh, support and assistance um, to communities that want to make changes. Um, the political parties are obviously involved in shaping local and national policies. Um, but organisations like Cambridge Carbon Footprint, Transition Cambridge, Carbon Neutral Cambridge, Cambridge Friends of the Earth, Cambridge Past, Present and Future, Smart Cambridge Transport, CamCycle, Sortition Foundation, Women's Institute, Extinction Rebellion, all these organisations are trying to make a difference and um, they can either advise, uh, provide advice or guidance or support um, or they can use your support um, in uh, financial support or organisational support um, to become more effective in reaching out to more people. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I look forward to your questions. I'm just going to leave you these key takeaways to think about and uh, thank you very much for listening.